This is News Fighters, where we fight the news so you don't have to. Welcome to News Fighters for today, Tuesday, 25th of February, 2020. I'm your host, Beck Melrose. Let's get to the big story of the day. We're going to go straight to Charlotte Goodlett in Sydney now, where a story is just starting to break. Charlotte, baboons have escaped a medical research facility. Three baboons escape a medical research facility. A troop of baboons on the loose. Baboons on the loose. Baboons on the loose tonight. Baboons on the loose. It's not clear yet how many baboons were on the loose. Remarkable. In response, Scott Morrison has decided to book a holiday. Inspiring stuff. Okay, yesterday on the show we talked about how the global warming apocalypse is going to kill us all and render the earth an unlivable hellscape. Let's see what's killing us today. Health authorities are preparing for a possible coronavirus pandemic. As the virus continues to spread well beyond China, our hospitals are preparing for a global pandemic. The impact will be more significant than the bushfires. A deadly disease jumping borders around the world. 37 countries have been affected. There are more than 80,000 cases and 2,700 deaths. And now for some in-depth analysis... Let's cross to our resident expert on infectious disease. You're all gonna die! There's been a lot of debate about what to call the coronavirus phenomenon. You might think that seeing it's hit so many countries killing thousands, it would be considered a pandemic. But one organisation says... Don't be so hasty. The World Health Organisation says the spread currently does not constitute a pandemic. OK, so it's not a pandemic. What is it then? I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern. And what a bummer. Just after we'd recovered from the large-scale hot fire situation of national significance. So here's how the Director General of the World Health Organization tried to explain the distinction. We're not witnessing the uncontained global spread of this virus. Does this virus have pandemic potential? Absolutely, it has. Are we there yet? From our assessment... Not yet. The Director General of the World Health Organization there, reassuring exactly nobody. It's a bit like asking, you're not cheating on me, are you, babe? From our assessment, not yet. It sounded like pretty inspiring news for coronavirus, though. It has potential. Does this virus have pandemic potential? Absolutely, it has. Shows potential? Is this guy describing a global health catastrophe or me in high school? Back in Australia, Seven News' Gemma Acton clearly wanted an Australian official to call it a pandemic, but none of them have. The solution? Just edit your words on top of Australia's chief medical officer. Here is an actual clip from Seven News last night. We are preparing as a nation for a coronavirus pandemic. Ah yes, love Channel 7. If someone doesn't say what you want them to, just put words in their mouth. I hear Australia's chief medical officer also thinks we're on the verge of another pandemic. We are preparing as a nation for the biggest Pokemon craze pandemic. And like Pokemon in 1999, coronavirus is spreading all around the world. Kids are trading it. And I think it's cute. And fears are mounting that the coronavirus outbreak in China will grow into a genuine pandemic following sharp rises in infections in South Korea, Iran and Italy. Fun fact, though, in Italy, it's called Peronivirus. Good thing it's in Italy. That's exactly where you want a deadly, contagious, airborne virus. Italians advise to give up on the habits of a lifetime. We have too much close contact. We shake hands. We kiss each other. We hug each other. Uh Uh-oh. If the fate of humanity relies on Italian chefs not kissing their fingers after they cook, we're all doomed. Also in Italy... The virus is impacting their world-famous culture. The Venice Carnival is being cancelled, and at the famous Milan Fashion Week, Armani was out of style, its new season collection debuting to an empty auditorium. In Milan, fashion shows went on without an audience. Ah, yes, the old blame the coronavirus pandemic when nobody comes to your show trick. Dad didn't come to my dance concerts for years because of SARS. It's not that I don't want to come, honey, it's just... This is a public health emergency of international concern. But that was real, though. He, he couldn't come. It, it wasn't safe. All right. Moving on. Back home, Aussie travellers heading overseas are concerned. For themselves. Are you a little worried about the coronavirus? A little bit. Tell me what your concerns are. That I'm going to get it? Yeah, that would be the primary concern, I reckon. Some Aussie cruise ship passengers are a little less worried, though. Someone brings it on board, I get an extra long holiday because they're stranded out there for 14 days, so as long as my work doesn't mind, I don't care. Ugh, Hawkey would proudly neck a scooey for this guy. 
Any boss who sacks anyone for taking 14 days at sea for an extended preventative quarantine is a bum. In good news, however, some Aussies locked in quarantine in Darwin and Christmas Island for the past two weeks have been released and finally allowed to go home to see loved ones. Here's some of them sharing what they're most looking forward to. Probably get a haircut and have some uh, nice seafood. A PS4. (laughs) Yep, he can't wait to play his favourite PS4 games, Red Blood Cell Redemption, Quarantine Simulator, and nothing like some Fortnite after being quarantined for a fortnight. And finally, Australia has its own world-leading expert. Stop all flights coming in at China. All flights coming out of China because now it's not just contained in Wuhan. For the safety of Australians, stop all flights coming into the country. Yeah, the 90s is back in fashion. Looks like Pauline Hanson, like all boomer celebrities, has gone back to playing the classic hits that made her famous. I believe we are in danger of being swamped by Asians. So in conclusion... Could it be that this whole coronavirus thing was invented in a lab by Pauline Hanson in an attempt to recreate her 1990s rise to fame? I don't know. I, I don't... Um, I won't cop that. Over the weekend, US presidential candidate Bernie Sanders won the Nevada Democratic caucuses in a landslide. Bernie Sanders' overwhelming victory that confirms his standing as the Democratic Party frontrunner. And according to three networks in the AP, we have now won the Nevada caucus. Yes, Bernie is on track to be the Democratic nominee. And some people are even saying he has a chance of beating this guy. Bing, bing, bong, bong, bing, 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 bing. What, the bing, bing, bang, bang, bong. It's bing, bong, bing, bing, bing. Bernie says the biggest reason he's the right candidate with the most electability to beat Trump is his massive army of volunteers. And in Nevada and in New Hampshire and in Iowa, what we showed is that our volunteers are prepared to knock on hundreds and hundreds of thousands of doors. One of those volunteers was friend of the show, New Zealander Dylan James, an academic currently living in Israel. He recently headed over to door knock for Bernie during the Iowa caucuses, and he chatted to News Fighters producer Dylan Behan about his experiences interacting with the American voters and why he thinks Bernie could actually win. So, Dylan, it's Dylan. Can you hear me? I can indeed. How are you going, Bill? What made you go volunteer for Bernie? How did you get over there? I hear you had to do some fundraising. Yeah, I set up a a Give a Little account, which is the New Zealand version of GoFundMe, and um, managed to raise uh, enough of my flights to get over there, which was amazing. Bernie has been... I've been following Bernie for the last five years, and, um, you know, I think a lot of us who are not Americans have just been watching him going, finally, some damn sense... Uh, in the American political discourse, you know, finally someone uh, rooting for, you know, universal health care and stuff like that. So, of course, you're you're a Kiwi. You could go and live under the, 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 the beautiful reign of Jacinta Ardern right now. Why are you what, – what makes you – why are you out there campaigning for Bernie? Why is Bernie becoming the president of America important for you? I mean, it really comes down to climate change. Um, only Bernie is really taking on climate change with the aggression that we need, um, actually taking on the logic of capitalism, which says we can, um, that it's profitable to destroy the planet and we should mm-hmm. therefore keep doing it. Um, and also, he's the only one who's really got a critique of American empire. And so once you got there, what were you doing? But yeah, basically, you just turn up, at a, you turn up at a field office and you mm-hmm. go, hey, I'm here to volunteer. And then they give you uh, a basic kind of training and then they send you out. Uh, with a big list of, uh, like an app, on an app, a list of houses to go and knock. And then who were your interactions with once you were over there? Were they Bernie-leaning people, Democrats? Did you interact with any Trump voters? What was what was the vibe on the ground yeah. when you were out knocking on doors? <laughs> Mixed. Mixed. Mixed, really? So, so, yeah, the, so the, app was, the app was leading you into some dangerous doorways, perhaps. <laughs> the, data, the data is not always good, let's just say that. Right, okay. So the problem is that, like, it's, it's the household, right? So often you have the kids, you know, who are like right. 18, 19, 20, who are for Bernie, but the parents are like staunch Trump or staunch Pete Buttigieg or something. So you get some really interesting interruptions on the doorstep. I remember there was one, I was going up to the house and I had the information that there was a woman called uh, Cara and she was 27 and she supported Bernie. So I went up to the house and was like, no, 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 you know, yada, yada, is Cara available? And this guy just comes around from the side of the house, staring at me with like hellfire in his eyes. And he was like, how can I help you? <laughs> and I was like, oh, is, is Kara here? And he's like, 
get the hell off my lord <laughs> Dara's only 15 oh my god I was like what oh shit was, it, was he like was a Clint, right, Clint Eastwood type like was he about to reach for his gun kind of thing was, I mean basically yeah. Yeah, I was I was actually really worried for my life I was like I'm just gonna get the fuck away <laughs> off, this, uh, off this lord here this is insane I mean there was one guy who invited me inside which is a rare treat when you're door knocking on the cold um, yep yep he, he voted for Obama and then he voted for Trump. Fascinating. So, that, so those people actually chat. exist. They're like the unicorns that we get we get oh, told yeah, about. Yeah, and I'm like, no Trump one could have gone from <laughs> Obama to Trump, but people actually did, and you met one. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's a kind of a vague anti-establishment mentality. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, people really are not as ideological as the media will try and make out. People, the media is trying to make out that there are moderate voters and progressive voters in the Democratic Party. Mm. But it's just not true. Like, no one, people don't really think like that. But like, I met a woman at a, at a bar who caucused for Bernie, like Bernie was her number one choice. And her number two choice was Amy Klobuchar. Mm. And I was like, well, okay, why Amy Klobuchar? And she was like, because she's pragmatic. And I was like, that is just so different to what you hear in the media. <laughs> I was like, does that mean that you think that Bernie is more pragmatic? And that was <laughs> why? You know, people just aren't ideological. And that's, that's the main thing that I think I learned on the doorstep. It's like, who who is fighting for them kind of thing. But do Trump voters, any of the ones you talk to, have feelings towards Bernie? I mean, in many ways, tr- Trump is like the, the 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 loud racist uncle and, and, and Bernie's just the loud socialist uncle a little bit. Like, do people, kind of, <laughs> do Trump voters kind of yeah, like, I mean, see things in Bernie they like as well? Absolutely. I did meet a couple of Trump voters who, who really liked Bernie and they felt that he was robbed of the nomination in 2016. Wow. Um, I mean, I obviously also met some Trump voters who were like, Bernie's a communist. Um, <laughs> what were their reactions to, to you being a, a Kiwi guy? Right? <laughs> you, was it hard not to lecture them? Like, I mean, you know, was it hard to just be like, hey, guys, flat whites, beetroot on hamburgers, gun control. I've got it all. I know how to run the world. <laughs> <laughs> was it, you know, what were they curious about what the hell you you were doing there? You know, I was worried that um, being a kind of interloping foreigner would be like, get the hell off my lawn, what are you telling me yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, don't tell, tell us how to vote. That but I found uh, pretty positive experiences. Um, obviously, people like the accent, which is, which yep, is uh, that's helpful. Yeah, a plus. Um, but also it gave me cred with Medicare for all because I'll be like, look, I've experienced universal health care where all yep. the places I've lived, you know, New Zealand, Australia, UK, Germany. And um, so people would be like, yes, yeah, so, like, how does it work? Are there lines? And Did they have any other questions about you know, New Zealand or Australia that, that they were curious about? Or Some people, yeah, were like, oh, I love New Zealand. I always want to go there. I've seen Lord of the Rings, et cetera. Um, <laughs> right. So you're also, doing a tur- a- you're also doing a tourism pitch while you're there. So. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you're sure tourism you- New Zealand should have They should have funded me. you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you think this will carry Bernie through to become the the nominee and then the and then the president? What's the feeling like on the yes. ground? Are people fired up? Are people oh, excited for Bernie? Fired up, so fired up. I mean, the the incredible feeling that I had on the ground it was it was like nothing else. I mean, just people from all walks of life. So caucus night, I drove a bunch of uh, Bhutanese immigrants uh, to their caucus site, and I observed the caucus, and it was amazing because. The Bernie campaign had did, done incredible outreach to immigrant communities in Iowa and made sure that they came out, you know, and really connected with them. And the, the caucus room, like, was almost entirely Bhutanese immigrants, and they all went for Bernie. We're talking like 125 people, and there were like seven people for Biden and one lone Warren supporter in the corner. And you know, one of, one of the things was like, look, how do you win a general election? It's not enough to get people ticking the box for Biden or for the, the Democrat, right? You need an army of volunteers. Mm. You know, I, I met a guy who sold his car and his house to come to Iowa and New Hampshire and uh, Nevada and South Carolina to do the early states. Wow. that's That about wraps it up. Thanks for your time. And um, thanks yeah, for man. sharing your stories <laughs> of uh, supporting Bernie and door knocking in, in Iowa. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. That's News Fighters for today. It was presented by me, Beck Melrose, written by me, Tom Cashman and Dylan Bean, and written, produced and edited by Dylan Bean. Remember, subscribe on your podcast app, write us a review on iTunes and tell your friends. See you next time. This is News Fighters, where we fight the news so you don't have to. Remarkable.